Now stagflation is a concept in Europe that goes back to the 1970s where we had 22% inflation and massive unemployment. And that is my real concern about where we go to from here. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Bill Blaine. Bill, welcome to On The Margin. Hi, delighted to be here. Thanks very much. And I apologize for my scruffy uh, appearance today, but it looks like we're finally getting summer here in the United Kingdom. So t-shirt weather it is. Hey, look at me. I'm also dressed for uh, warm weather, too. Uh, I think you're looking great, Bill, for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, you're looking great to me. Um, all right, let's just get into it here. Uh, you know, you did this great interview on Macro Voices the other day, and one topic that I wanted to really dig in on here is you kind of drew this distinction in between uh, inflation in the price of financial assets and inflation in the real economy. And you kind of talked about this topic of when there is inflation in the price of financial assets, how that tends to bleed into the real economy. So if we could just start there, what do you really mean by that statement? Well, when quantitative easing was first proposed and first put into practice uh, soon after the global financial crisis began in 2007, you know, 2010 is when QE asset purchases really kicked off. The big fear then was that by effectively creating money, you were bound to create inflation. And we did create massive inflation, but all that inflation was locked in to financial assets. You push up the price of bonds by pushing down their yields. That causes what we then nicknamed yield tourism, mm. which is people then having to garner returns by buying other financial assets, equities, and that's what's underlaying the equity rally of the last 11 years. Um, and that um, wealth, uh, sorry, that inflation remained tied up in financial assets. And we did not see the expected inflation cropping up into the real economy. But now we are beginning to see the effects of monetary experimentation start to transfer into the real economy. And that occurs in a number of different ways. Um, people are desperate to acquire assets that don't look to be overpriced. So instead of buying financial assets, they start buying um, real assets mm. and housing is one. Housing. And what can you tell me about housing? In every major occidental economy, exactly the same. Every single market is going up at an incredible rate, far faster than the real rate um, at which wages are growing. So housing becomes more and more unaffordable. And this leads us on to the next thing that the, the effects of this imported inflation then start to breed social inequality concerns where people cannot get housing, so they need to join the rental sector. The price of rentals starts to go through the roof, which means that people need to demand higher wages simply to pay rentiers higher um, uh, rental costs. Mm. So that's just one mechanism by which you start to see real inflation cropping in. But the one that really concerns me the most is we are going through a definite inflation spike. And we know mm -hmm. that that inflation is supply side generated. It's uh, all the supply chain and breakages that have occurred through the pandemic. So everything here in Europe, we're suffering a devastating shortage of lorry drivers, you know, which sounds remarkable, but um, shops are beginning to run out of stuff. We've got one third of the chicken um, yeah. chain Nando's, which is very popular here in Europe, is closed because they cannot get chicken supplies because of the shortage of um, lorry drivers. Because who wants to be a lorry driver when you can make the same wages for half the effort working in the hospitality sector or going off and working for Amazon? It's another form of um, uh, distortion that's going on, this supply side thing. But you've got enormous inconsistencies now across the whole economy with this um, shortage of labor in certain sectors. And again, that has the, per the effect of pushing up wages. And then, of course, we've got all the effects that, um, uh, for instance, this morning we had the German automakers warning that the current chip shortage due to the lack of uh, chips coming from the Far East is going to result in two, three years damage to their balance sheets in terms of what they're able to sell. But these are all supply side. Mm. Um, and they are 
you know, they are stimulating the inflation we see just now. But why are we getting that inflation? Because with the pandemic finishing, we're having everyone suddenly spending the savings that they've accumulated during the pandemic. And it's creating this bounce in demand, further adding to the inflation forces in the economy. I mean, I, I was talking this morning um, that this uh, recovery spike that we've just seen is something of a dead cat bounce in that it's really only putting us back to where we would expect to be. And if you actually take a look at the numbers, um, it, it certainly seems to show that economies are unlikely to recover as dramatically and as strongly as people have been expecting in the wake of the pandemic. And that makes me fear two things. The first is we have, we definitely have supply side inflation from the supply um, problems I talked about. We also have this dangerous import of the inflation that is embedded within financial assets now leaking into the economy. And you have the likelihood that economies aren't going to go much faster and stronger. I can come back and talk about why that's the case, which leads us to inflation and the very dangerous scenario of a flatlining global economy for all kinds of reasons. And that effectively is stagflation. Now, stagflation is a concept in Europe that goes back to 1970s, where we had 22% inflation and massive unemployment. And that is my real concern about where we go to from here. Bill, you, you're making my job hard. There's so many questions that I want to ask you <laughs> based on the follow up there. I don't even know where to start. OK, let me start with the inflation point here. So I love that you just separated kind of the supply based inflation with longer term inflation may be associated with money printing and this concept of stagflation. I want to start just because there's a lot to unpack there with this kind of labor shortage that we're seeing right now and some of these supply side driven things. So you mentioned one third of Nando's being closed uh, in the UK. Um, so I've been talking about this as well recently. Anecdotally, you're starting to see it crop up all over the place. I live in Williamsburg, New York. Every single restaurant that I go to nowadays, you know, it's, uh, hey, we're short staffed. Hey, because we're short staffed, there's a surcharge associated with this, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at least in the US, people are blaming this on on the common narrative is this is due to unemployment benefits that's being extended by the federal government. But there's a great chart out there. Uh, I'll see if I can find it for you later, um, where if you look at non-farm payrolls between April and July in states that have prematurely ended the benefits versus ones that have continued with the benefits, there's literally no change in labor market participation. So it's kind of like we're looking at something else. So is it you, you kind of mentioned this financial cushion and, and savings that people had built up during the pandemic. What do you attribute? Why are, Why is every business just struggling to get labor right now? I mean, what, what's your take on well, that? Well, it's, it's a very interesting one as to, to the way that uh, things have, the way that the, the pandemic end game is shaping up. Mm -hmm. And I don't for one th second think that the pandemic is over. I think we're going to, it's now going to be a long term factor. Um, I also think this uh, story about you know, furlough money, discouraging people from actively seeking work mm -hmm. and that um, real wages are too high uh, and that um, the industry is being killed, the hospitality business is being killed by minimum wage legislation. I, I think that's all a right wing distraction and we should ignore it. Mm -hmm. The reality for workers is that it is an extremely low paid sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that has always been the case. And, you know, we, I can give you the, the same kind of uh, anecdotal evidence that hospitality is in our almost terminal decline everywhere. I have friends who actually cancelled their wedding this year, not because um, of any personal problem they're having, but because they're worried that the restaurant that they were going to have the reception in would not be able to guarantee the quality of service and food that you they would expect. So they're putting mm -hmm. it back till things normalize. But the reality is for service and restaurants to return to the kind of standards, you're gonna have to start paying people properly. And that means the price of hospitality meals is gonna go through the roof if we want to get that kind of thing again. Why is that? Because I don't think young people anymore want to take that kind of job they are looking for other things to do. And when you can go and get a job delivering um, pizzas 
for Deliveroo, or you can um, you you want to go and um, work for Amazon and be paid better, then go and do it. You know, so there is an endemic labor supply, and the only way that that corrects itself is when wages starts to balance with supply. And that will mean we're going to see a much smaller hospitality sector, I reckon, going forward, because there will just be fewer people willing to work for low wages. And those of us who are consumers of hospitality service are going to be unwilling to pay more for it. Uh, so, you know, that that's a massive change in the way that we consume that is being generated by the pandemic. And I think if we look at uh, a number of other industries. I mean, the other one that fascinates me is transport. Mm. Uh, let's look at the aviation companies. Let's think about Boeing and Airbus. Uh, we, we really haven't worked out what the long term implications for them is going to be as a result of the way that the pandemic has changed behaviors and also the cost structure. Bill, I think that's a really, I mean, it's really interesting that you point out those industries because I, I agree. I think from a different generation, uh, young folks might be less willing to um, want to take part in those jobs. I think the other maybe longer term implications here of inflation is this idea of money printing as well. And I want to talk about a regime shift, right? So it's funny, there's this this narrative around inflation, right? People kind of point to, uh, hey, prices are going up, uh, all this like shortage of the labor market, etc. That's probably being driven by the supply side, these supply side issues that you and I are talking about. But I think there's a longer term trend here, right? Which is uh, that, you know, the, the main factors are just super, super loose monetary conditions, right? Um, and also just a lack of structural growth in the economy. So there are kind of two things here and people lump them into the same argument, but I view them as being very different. And one thing that I just can't help but notice, you know, after we, there was this kind of uh, reflation narrative that was really taking heat around like October, November, December, and people say, hey, growth is going to come back, commodities are going to come up. But now look at where we are. Um, the Delta variant of COVID is kind of rearing its ugly head. Uh, labor force participation is not where we thought it was going to be. And it looks like market participants are settling back into this regime that has taken place. Like, look what's happening. More stimulus looks like it's coming. Taper talks are falling off. And the stock market is starting to march steadily up right in the face of all these uh, supposed economic problems. So what's your take on all that? Do you I mean, do you see long term secular inflation coming here? Are we just settling back into how things were pre pandemic? Is that realistic? You know, how do you see this kind of all going forward? OK, so my very simple take on this is that we are now seeing the consequences of the last 13 years of monetary experimentation. You know, we, we, we had to central banks had to step in to intervene uh, to change the the narrative after mm -hmm. 2008 and the collapse of uh, Lehman. It was vital that we repaired the banks, but there are consequences from the way that was done. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you do massive printing, massive monetary printing through QE. You boost the price of stocks, but you also do things that um, have negative effects. And, and one of these is on companies. Uh, where you end up with an awful lot of companies that should have gone through a natural Darwinian selection process and gone bust, but ultra low in interest rates keeps them going. And the ability to print money at any pace, as we've seen in particularly the last two years of pandemic, has simply generated, yeah, it's kept the economy open, but it's also generated massive inefficiencies. And these inefficiencies and increased bureaucracy, they all seem like little issues at the time, you know, just that little bit extra you need to do, but they mount up. And these are the things that are having such a pernicious effect on the global economy just now. If you distort interest rates and keep them artificially low, it does not create growth. And the easiest place to see that is not in the States or the UK, where there is this driving and triple entrepreneurial enthusiasm to get things done but take a look at what's happening in europe you know all this money all, all this bank rescue and all this qe and um pandemic emergency programs has done nothing to create real growth at all and the reason for that is that by distorting market you create consequences and every single thing we've talked about so far in terms of the threat of stagflation 
the inability of um, uh, sectors to find employment and changing demand for goods all stems from the consequences of monetary policy. I mean, I, there is a famous quote, I can't remember who it's by, somebody famous in economics said that at its heart, all inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Mm. Well, that's partially true. I mean, monetary experimentation that we've seen over the last few years and the massive distorting effects, that's one of the reasons I reckon that economies are so lackluster. One thing that I want to return to that you brought up at the, at the beginning, at the very beginning of this uh, interview, um, is this idea of the connection to housing uh, as well. So maybe maybe inflation mm -hmm. is primarily a monetary or financial phenomenon, but I promise you, because I personally am experiencing it right now, it has real impacts in the economy, right? And one of the one of the areas that I just I love that you talked about was this idea of housing. Um, and, you know, that, this attracted a lot of attention probably two months ago. Uh, there were headlines kind of in the U.S. about BlackRock buying up uh, residential housing. And for me, that's just such a almost like a dystopian headline. Right. I mean, owning land and property and housing specifically is kind of key to the American social contract. And that's at risk of being disrupted. But one concept that I've heard you talk about that I haven't heard anywhere else and that I love is this this impact on the behavior of a generation. Right. So the behavioral impact of that going away, because if you think about like my parents when they were graduating school, I mean, everyone kind of thinks, OK, I graduate school, I save up a bit of money, then I buy a house. And that's not only a big step in my life from a personal standpoint, it's a huge financial unlock. So now you have a whole generation. People in my generation do not think that way at all, at all. No one's like, I'm graduating college and I'm going to go buy a house soon. It's like. This crazy thing oh, that you yeah, could never uh, afford. Michael, you're, you're absolutely, you're spot on correct. Um, here in the UK, London is the most cosmopolitan city on the planet, more so than New York, which used to be. But London's where it's at. Now, my kids, um, there is just no way that they would be able to afford accommodation to buy their own flat the way that my generation was able to do and get on the property ladder. You're talking about you know, half a million pounds, which is, you know, what, yeah. $750,000 um, um, to go and buy a starter flat, probably a one or two bedroom place, 30 minutes from the center of town on the worst mass transport system on the planet, bar none. Um, and, you know, people are getting discouraged and they're asking themselves, why do I bother? Okay, I'm never going to be able to get in the property ladder. All these corporate giants like BlackRock and now Allianz and here in the UK have started their um, their buy to rent businesses where they are becoming massive landlords and will control the rental. And people are saying, OK, I'm not going to spend money in a flat. I'm going to go and spend my money in other things. But of course, that changes the behavior of corporates. So the rentiers see that, OK, these people have got money. How do I get more of it in rental for them? So now we've got the ridiculous situation that you cannot get on the mortgage ladder in the UK and you cannot afford to get rent in the center of town anywhere close to work. So young people, rather than facing the misery of an hour's commute every day, are thinking, what else can I do? I know what, I'll go and work for Amazon. Yet yeah, again, Amazon. Uh, what they're not deciding to go and do is work in local restaurants uh, because I think they see that as bloody hard work with no reward. And yes, people, I mean, I, I think we do um, underestimate the importance of behavioral psychology in the economics profession. You know, we have to ask ourselves what motivates people to do things. Um, but this is only one small part of the uh, wage inflation push that we're seeing going through. Millennials get a lot of flack right for saying things like hey this is the soft snowflake generation and you guys want to just uh, spend your money on uh, avocado toast and you're not saving it etc right and one thing that i think people don't draw the connection to properly is this is this uh connection between consumerism or the desire to spend money and the lack of a path to savings or financial opportunity so basically the the psychological connection is if I let's say I'm graduating and um, 
I see this path where if I just save up my money uh, for a couple years, I can afford to buy a home. And if I buy that home, then that's going to be this big financial unlock. It's going to enable me to do all these things. Well, then that impacts my daily life, right? Because I don't, I don't spend some money here. I'm like, oh, if I, you know, I got to save so I can make sure that I get to this goal, right? If you do not have that goal, then it impacts your ability to spend. You're like, eh, I'm not even really saving anything. This is an um, impossible goal to reach anyway. So yeah, I'll just spend two extra, uh, two extra dollars here on avocados, you know, at Chipotle or something like that. And you know, it's funny when I ran this theory by my my parents, they said, huh. And so that actually reminds me of this theory. Uh, that people used to say back in the 80s, you have all these yuppies spending money on BMWs, that's only because they can't afford the second home anymore. Which was, that was just such a light bulb moment for me because I was like, man, this trend has been going on for a long time, uh, actually. Um, and, and people like to draw this distinction be between, oh, millennials care more about experiences and blah, blah, blah. It's like, maybe we just can't afford the things that our parents <laughs> could afford, you know? Maybe that's the causal error. I, I yeah, I, I think it basically is that simple. Yeah, people say, oh, I'm not going to buy a flat, so I'm, I'm going to start spending all my money on having really great experience type holidays. Bollocks to that. What they're discovering is they don't own their own flat with the advantages and wealth creation and accumulation that creates for them, but they are paying as much in rental as they would have paid on a mortgage, if not more. But they cannot get the... Uh, you know, to, to buy a flat in London, let's think about it. If it's a £500,000 flat, which will be pretty dingy and horrible in the centre of London mm -hmm. or somewhere close to the centre of London, by which I mean a one-hour commute, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be talking about 500000 So that means you're going to have to have 200000 in savings and you're going to have to be earning £100,000 a year, which is roughly three times the medium salary in the UK. So unless the bank of mum and dad is there with the dosh to help you out, you don't stand a chance. And this again becomes another element in the psychology that there are some that will have that access to the bank of mum and dad, most don't. So again, that changes it. But the idea that the millennials suddenly find that their £40,000 per annum salaries allows them to go and have avocado toast every morning, which is a delicious dish, let me add, especially put dukkha on top of it. <laughs> I recommend you all try it. It is um, it's delicious. You know, they're not doing avocado toast because they can't afford it because they've spent all the income on their rental. And they're now going into the stores and discovering that stuff is more expensive. I mean, mm. avocados are now two pound each in the UK. I mean, th this is really the end of the world stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, you Bill can buy plenty of sourdough. Yeah, uh, you can talk to my mom too. She's doing that very classic pandemic thing of learning to make her own sourdough. Um, so I'm encouraging her. I, I got to admit, her, I tried it. I didn't succeed. <laughs> Howdy, everyone. If you're a long term investor in Ethereum, then listen up because I am talking directly to you here. If you've been listening to the show for the last two months, then you know that I am a big, big fan of ETH and the entire world of DeFi that's being built on top of it. It's honestly just super, super interesting, but. It's also probably the single greatest wealth creation opportunity that I am ever going to see in my entire life. And the best thing about ETH is that you can hold it, but with this new upgrade to 2.0, you can also stake it and earn yield that way. The only problem is under the current set of rules, unless you have 32 ETH or at today's price is almost $100,000, then you can't stake it. Until now. Our good friends over at Matrix Sport just unrolled a solution which allows investors with as few as 5 ETH to start staking today. At the time of this recording, you can earn up to 9% APY, although that's going to vary based on the protocol. So stop what you're doing. Stop listening to me. Go click the link at the bottom of this episode. If it's on YouTube or Spotify or Apple or whatever it is, click that link, go over to the website and tell them that I sent you. All right, give me a little credit, but definitely go click the link. Start learning about how you can stake your ETH and earn yield or other yield generation opportunities. So... We do a weekly roundup here on, on the margin. So end of the week, we kind of look at a bunch of charts and, hey, this is interesting, that's interesting. And uh, last week's, um, maybe two weeks ago, housing was kind of a central feature. I looked at two uh, things, which is one, in the U.S., how many years of, of median salary does it take to purchase a home in the U.S.? Um, and also, what is the median age of a homeowner in the U.S. over time? So I'll, I'll, just, I'll tell you one and I'll ask you to guess the other. So uh, the median number of years it took to work to afford a home in the United States has risen from three years in the 1970s to six and a half years today. 
right? So that's a pretty startling statistic. But if I were to ask you, what is the average, what is the median age of a homeowner in the U.S., what would you say? Uh, it's probably going up mid-40s. 47, 47. And that has risen eight years since the financial crisis alone, which is pretty crazy. Wow. That's actually very important. Yeah. Uh, that it, it, it just changed how, yeah, it illustrates just how the manipulation of interest rates has real consequences. Mm. You think by lowering interest rates, you make things more affordable. No, you actually create inflation, making them less affordable. Bill, you know, going back to this this great point that you made in your, your sort of opening speech here, um, it, especially within finance, I listen to a lot of these talks and people send, tend to focus on this debate that's going on. Are we going towards an environment of inflation versus one of secular inflation versus one of secular deflation? And to me, that's an important part of the discussion. But for me, it all kind of goes back to this idea of wealth inequality. I've heard you reference the same thing, and you kind of put this issue of wealth inequality at the center of a lot of your thinking as well. Talk to us about why is that such an important concept to understand, and why is it at the center of, of your thoughts kind of as well? Well, you know, wealth inequality is definitely getting worse. Um, the idea that you're going to get billionaires trickling down their wealth to benefit society, you know, that's a, that, that, to me, that feels like propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have some billionaires who are doing enormous good and they're trying to invest in the right kind of things, but basically wealth for wealth's sake seems to be the game. And again, inequality creates behaviors. And it all comes back to this concept we've been talking about today, which is the way in which the consequences of um, monetary experimentation create behavioral um, changes in people. And you're, we're beginning to see that very clearly in people getting angry about the haves versus the have-nots. And people are, you know, to, to some extent, it's disguised by some of the woke um, agenda, um, which really just covers up some of the inconsistencies that are now so glaring in society. But you can look at lots of different um you know, examples of how it changes people and I'll, I'll let me discuss two of them the, the first would be uh here in the uk we've got a massive um issue with um you know poverty mm. um not as bad as i've seen in some american cities i mean i was absolutely shocked and horrified when i was in san francisco last year but um we've got this program that was put in place for the pandemic and it's 20 pounds per week in universal credit that goes to the poorest people in society and that credit is set to end at the beginning of the next month in, in october that's um 80 pounds a month that people are not going to have now 80 pounds a month to anyone in the middle class or upper class is you know the marginal utility of that is zero but if you are at the bottom of the pile 20 quid is an awful lot of money and the real difference is the number of kids, you know, uh, school kids who will either eat or not get breakfast, depending on that 20 quid. And that creates all kinds of social strains. The second aspect of inequality is inequality of um, opportunity. And one example of that would be in the pension business. If you work for government, you're going to get a government pension and you're going to get that pension paid no matter what. And I think some wag recently worked out that within a few years, 120% of UK tax revenues will be used for paying the UK government's pension bill. Hmm. Um, that sounds great reason to go off and be a bureaucrat. But for those of us who aren't bureaucrats and aren't getting government pensions, you know, we're all having to save for our pensions and our futures, you know, so we're putting it into our retirement plans, um, which by and large are at risk depending on the actions mm. of these same bureaucrats who are feather bedded with their pensions. And these are two examples of inequality, um, one of um, poverty and the other of, well, what are we all working for? And it changes the way people think. Yes. Um, it will change the way that people vote. I think it's interesting that at the moment we tend to have, you know, even in the States, um, you know, a, a fairly right wing government, despite um, the 
um, you know, the the left wing Democrats pushing for change, um, and it's fascinating to see the pushback against anything from the Saunders end of the spe spectrum, anything that's proposed that even sounds socialist. But you know what? Unless we shift towards a more fairer um, income distribution, you're going to see enormous pressures develop now. It has happened in the past, and a good example of that is 1945 here in the UK at the end of the Second World War, where voters, after five years of massive tension, threat and danger, much like COVID in mm. some respects, the, the electorate turned around through Churchill out of office and replaced him with the most left-leaning Labour government the UK has ever had. And there were some enormous strides were made at that time in universal health care, the National Health Service, which was once one of the great shining jewels of the UK. Um, these things were all introduced as a result of change and tension. And I just suspect that if we continue to see the pandemic continue to threaten and we see all this growing income inequality, you will result in a pushback and when that pushback comes i think it's going to be far more dramatic than people currently expect i completely agree with you one one thing that i often see that i feel like is missing from discussions of you know the the this rarely gets stated outright but my my feeling when you listen to a lot of um kind of financial industry pundits is hey look at what the nasdaq or the stock market has done there's got to be some mean reversion event right there has to be some return to sanity and what i would say is that no bureaucrat right people the people that are making the decision at the fed no one is going to make a big decision like this without a catalyst without some cloud cover and i would give you another example that i pay attention to through history I mention this often. I was a classics major. I look at the Roman Empire a lot as a parallel to what's going on with developed empires today like America. The transition from the Roman Empire, the, the Roman Republic to an empire was around 80 years of civil war, right? So the Roman mm. uh, uh, Republic existed for about 500 years before it made this transition. And this transition was directly against every you know they were founded on the basis that there is no king there is no dictator and what made them eventually comfortable with that change was just 80 years of suffering and they said enough is enough i don't care i will take anything right so i'm i i don't know what this catalyst is going to be but it feels like there there has to be a catalyst for there to be major change and i feel like that gets left out of a lot of these sorts of discussions basically I don't know yeah, well, I, I, I'm wondering if the pandemic is the catalyst. Now, I'm I'm fairly hopeful that we're not going to see uh, eight years of civil war as the. I'm not suggesting that either. Yeah, no, no, no. no I'm, I'm rather hopeful we can enjoy uh, avoid that. But what I do think we're going to see is you know behavioural change in people and that sort of shift into populism. But as we're seeing, and again, you know, I. It, it, Whenever I talk about American politics, I guarantee I'll get hate mail telling me, shut up, Limey, you've no right to comment on America. Uh, <laughs> we've got to because it's the number one economy. and We've got to look at it. And what really worries me is just the division in thought in America between the extreme left and the extreme right and the failure to find any common middle ground. Um, you know, everyone talks about, hey, people, let's be united while pushing their own agenda. And there just doesn't seem to be a process of um, finding a solution. In fact, the British way seems to be better, where we just muddle and dither our way through every single crisis. And, you know, eventually we get there at the end of the day. And, you know, everyone said, hey, Brexit, how stupid can you be? Well, at the end of the day, you know, Brexit is Brexit. And it has not stopped the sun coming up every morning. Just yeah. means you can't get the best French wines as cheaply as you used to anymore. So, so I want to actually just like zoom out here for a second and connect... This is something that I've been noticing, which is I'm not a big philosophy guy. I don't know if you ever read The Onion, but there's a great uh, article, uh, which is guy in philosophy class needs to shut the F up. And I think there's a limited efficacy to, to philosophical frameworks. But one that has always sat really well with me is I can't remember whose ideology this was, but basically your happiness is correlated to your ability to advance in society. 
essentially, to see this path in advance. And all this stuff that we're talking about, wealth inequality, housing, uh, inflation and financial bubbles, all of that is making it really difficult for people of a certain generation or demographic to see the path to advance. And when you have a group of people that don't can't see the path to advance in the status quo way, you start taking higher convex payout, higher volatility options. So all like the political represent manifestation of this is populism, right? So in the US, you've got like AOC on one side and kind of Trumpism on the other. And it's very easy to say those are very different. But for me, I see them both as being populism. They're very so that's kind of the political spectrum of populism. On the financial uh, market side of things, you see meme stocks uh, and you see cryptocurrencies, right? Um, Yeah. Now, I have a very negative view of meme stocks, very positive view of cryptocurrencies. I think you might have a different view than I do. Well, uh, so I'd just be yeah. curious about what you think about that whole framework. Well, the, the, this, again, is all consequences, consequences of monetary distortion. Um, mm-hmm. People invest in meme stocks because they want to get as filthy rich as all these people who are getting filthy rich on stocks. And cryptocurrencies have taken on a life of their own based on the expectation that people are going to get extremely wealthy on the back of it. And, you know, it becomes um, self-driving, not self-fulfilling, but a self-driving concept that if you you all pile into cryptos, you'll do extremely well. Now, here on my phone, I've got my, um, I'm, I did this for a laugh a couple of months ago, where I put 100 quid into one of these Bitcoin exchanges and we were discussing cryptos in the office this morning on one of our regular calls. And I was absolutely amazed to see that my 100 quid is now 170 quid. You know, that's staggering. Why? Well, I've read up on the cryptos I invested in Cardano and um, uh, God, I can't even remember what the other one was called. But I, you know, I can't understand anything that a cryptocurrency can do that I can't do just as well with my credit card. Mm. And I can trust the banks. Yeah, I know all you millennial types who all go on about you can't trust banks and stuff. But you know what? I know exactly what my assets are doing. I don't need to be invested in this um, hyped, utterly hyped market that cryptos represent. And when you actually step back and read through the underlyings, yeah, very interesting, very clever concept and idea but i think it's more an idea in search of a real application that has now been hijacked by expectations that it's going to make you extremely wealthy and until um someone can demonstrate a crypto that really delivers something good and new that is useful i'm going to remain a complete naysayer and bracket them all into the same ponzi dock as mean Mm -hmm. stocks Sorry to be so brutally frank with you, Mike. That's but totally fine. I'm happy to. If you're invested in crypto, what you're really doing is hoping that you are not the last greatest idiot to join the queue. Hmm. Well, so I, I would uh, I would gently push back. <laughs> uh, okay. Here's my here's my yeah, here's my thoughts. So. Um, so I think there are a couple of different uh, notions there, which is one, uh, you know, crypto tends to get bucketed in this like monetary phenomenon. And that's because the first, mm-hmm. so to me, what crypto is, is it's an innovation in how networks monetize and how they're owned, right? That's to me what this is. This is a, this is a revolution in turn. It solves a coordination problem. Now, the first application, which is why so many people think of it from this monetary context was Bitcoin. And that was solving a coordination problem across money networks. And it, it, it is, there, there is, I am part of a, a younger generation. I probably do have less, uh, let's say, trust in my bank. But I also just don't think that they're offering a particularly good service. So a much oh, more yeah, real manifestation of this is that I am essentially the de facto CFO of my, our company, Blockworks. And I got to tell you, my relationship with my bank is absolutely horrendous. And I know we're not like the biggest customer for them, but it's like logging into this bank, it's a generation of younger people. We're, this is important. And it's it's a horrendous user experience. So I would say there's that, I just don't think they're offering a particularly good product. It's not aimed at me. And I think there's room for disruption there, right? I, I so don't disagree with you at all that banks do need to evolve. But remember, most banks are working with uh, data systems that go back 40, 50 years, which is right. why if you're an old style programmer who still speaks these dead languages, you can get paid a fortune to keep Mm -hmm. their clunky old tech going. And yes, I can definitely see advantages. I mean, I've got my 
um, my Revolute card sitting here so that I can, you know, do all my FX dead easily whenever, you know, if I ever get to travel again. Uh, so yeah, there are advantages and there are definitely ways that we can use fintech to improve the world. And I'm sure somebody's going to work out something clever to do with uh, blockchain at some point. But cryptos, mm. you know, what do we need them for? Mm. So here's what I would say. So there's kind of this, uh, there, there's one, the monetary aspect here. And you, maybe, you, you know, you can either believe that uh, the Bitcoin is a is a viable competitor of being some form of digital gold or, or you don't. You're probably pretty familiar with that argument. I'm not sure it's really worth diving too far in there. Yeah, yeah, what no, I would I, say I, is I, I, I would talk to the younger generation. I would just say talk to the younger generation because there are maybe Michael, the distinction the most... that exists in your in your mind between something being real? The most fascinating real? arguments we have in the office are every Monday morning we have our huddle and I, I'm blessed to work for a very exciting firm called Shard Capital in London. Mm -hmm. And I have our uh, asset managers and our traders all on the call and we talk about the things. And one of the most um, interesting debates we have are between my generation of old um, market dogs and the younger generation of really tech savvy guys and it's mm -hmm. fascinating your generation seem to get crypto in a way we don't but I'm stopping here I'm, I'm basing my experience on 40 years in the markets and watching a succession of crashes in bond markets and stock markets of unrealistic dreams and unfulfilled expectations and you learn to step back and I describe myself as an optimistic pessimist but you know what I can smell rotten fish from a mile away now and I'm looking at crypto and yeah I can see things that are attractive one of the reasons I invested in Cardano was because yeah there is a chance that it may be a way of providing something that works but it's an awful long way Bitcoin, first iteration of crypto, many of the ones that have followed it have become slightly better. Um, we could get on and we could talk about all the problems with uh, the CO2 wastage when you're mining the stuff or the insecurities that go with it. I mean, look, look at this call today. We've had to stop three times because tech problems. And, and you mm -hmm. tell me that crypto exchanges are going to be completely safe. I'm, I'm just not a believer. So I'm afraid we'll have to differ on that one. But otherwise, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. It and again, it highlights behavioral changes. I think cryptos are all about behavior caused by income inequality, the desperate desire to get rich without really trying too hard. Now, here I am in the dotage twilight years of my career, having worked and enjoyed every single moment in finance. But I know you have to work damn hard to get anywhere in it. Mm. And, uh, you know, yeah. investing in Bitcoin is not going to make your fortune, I don't think. So here's one important distinction that I would draw, because as someone who's operating primarily in this industry, it's actually an industry of workaholics. There's the people who are the, the hot money speculators that are FOMOing into things like Cardano and NFTs and stuff like that. But there is a actually a very young industry of people who are working. Like I work at 24-7, you know, types get here. Mm -hmm. This is Labor Day for me. And here we're sitting and recording this. I don't have uh, yeah. real weekends or holidays or anything like that. Uh, and there is a, a generation of, of folks like me who are doing this. Um, and one thing that I would just say in general is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to understand this space. We talked about, you know, what you just mentioned of basically the entire financial infrastructure being built on 45, uh, you know, 50 year old technology. You know, that's a term technical debt. And what's essentially happened mm -hmm. and the reason why fintech, there's limited success or efficacy is because no matter how well you build the front end, it always got to go. It has to go to the back end. Right. And you're running on these legacy rails. And what I, how I would maybe define it and maybe just think about it is this is a different way of uh, transacting. Right. And there are different financial rails that are being built, maybe with a better architecture. Right. So just like in the Internet, uh, where it kind of started off as this like sketchy thing. And there were like very legitimate reasons. Right. There's a lot of porn, a lot of crime, et cetera. That's how it all starts off. But then you actually say, hey, there's some emergent. There's this is a new system. There are emergent behaviors and properties that are coming from it. Maybe real value can get built. And if you look at this pr from the perspective of the dot com bubble, everyone was right. Right. Everyone was right in the dot com bubble. The folks that said, guys, this is absolutely nuts. You have companies IPOing and 5Xing the first day they go. Those people were 100 percent right. 
that it was destined to, to crash for a period of time. But the, also the true believers who said, guys, this is unique and you need to set up and pay attention and take a long time frame. Those people were also right. So I would gently suggest that I think that's the moment that we're at in crypto, which is that there's something very interesting here. Will there be huge capitulations? Absolutely. I even would go so far as to say most retail participants have probably lost money in this space. Mm-hmm. I have made disgustingly bad investments, and I'm not embarrassed to say that. But what I but what I do believe is that over time there will be growth, and that's why I'm happy to to work in this in this space. Well, so, you, you know, I I have um, I guess one of the tricks I've learned is that it's not what I know to be true about the sheer unsustainability of beam stocks or cryptos. What actually matters is what the market believes because the market mm-hmm. is just an enormous voting machine. And the fact that I know cryptos are completely and utterly the wrong doesn't matter because the rest of the market believes they're good, so they're going up. Now, as a smart trader, I try and play that, but I've now got to the stage where I don't know whether they're going up or going, so I'm completely out now. Apart from, as I just showed you, my £170 that I have made investing in Cardano and pretty much had forgotten about it until someone asked me on the call this morning, how's your Bitcoin account going? You know, it makes me giggle. Um, yeah. But if enough people believe in something, the good trader will play on that and benefit from it. The trick is how do you time a market that is based on a logic? Mm. Is that a word? Yeah. yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, we'll make it a word. It's okay. And uh, I, you know, I know we're uh, we, we've already used a bunch of time here. Yeah, we've gone through technical difficulties. Bill, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm not hey, sure. We Michael, see I would love space, to have but, another chat with man. you as soon as possible, and hopefully, I'll get a computer that works properly next time. Perfect. We'll do we'll do this again. We'll have to do it like four hours next time because I think we've got a lot more ground to cover. So, uh, well, Bill, ho- thank you ho- so much. Hopefully later this year, um, I will find myself across in the States and uh, you know, I will probably host some events in New York or something and we maybe get a chance to meet up then. And next time we talk, I'll introduce you to some of my stuff like the banjo sitting behind me, the tin of tartan paint and, and all the other crap that tends yes, to accumulate so much- in a home office. So much we didn't get to get into. Well, Bill, thank you for being so generous with your time. And, this has uh, been great. If you do thank you very York, much. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Okay. All the best. <laughs>